Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Like many of you at home, I sat my butt in a showing of Jurassic World Dominion, and absolutely hated it. You can find my video here on how Universal managed to screw it up by making it both boring and nonsensical, but its release has once again stirred up internet discussions over the whole series. Many critics return to the Jurassic films to discuss which ones are good, which are bad, and why they're all bad besides the original, that sort of stuff. Despite how much I dislike where the series has gone in the past decade with the world movies, it breaks my heart to see many critics still dunking on the Lost World. Oh, you're breaking our heart. Of course, not all movie critics or reviewers. There is no single entity of evil critics who try to ruin all the fun like fandoms want you to think. So for this video, I'll be looking at one famous take from Nostalgia Critic. Don't get me wrong, even if I don't agree with all of his opinions, I've still been a fan for about a decade at this point. He did try to argue quite miserably why the Amazing Spider-Man movies are better than Raimi's, but I found it in my heart to forgive him. You want forgiveness? Get religion. The last thing I want is for this video to be an attack on Doug Walker, but on the general arguments against Spielberg's sequel. This video will be formatted like a generic response video. I'll play Doug's clips, respond to them, and repeat. So guys, let's dig this up. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Dang, we've come to the point where I'm feeling nostalgic watching the Nostalgia Critic. Till now you have become the very thing you swore to destroy. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of hype for Steven Spielberg to do another movie. Before you even knew what you had. You patented it, you packaged it, you slapped on the plastic lunchbox and now you're selling it, you're selling it. Well, Lost World. Alright, for the sake of fairness, The Lost World was not part of the original plan. Author of the first novel, Michael Crichton, had no intentions at first for writing a follow-up. He only did so due to pressure from Spielberg and the original Jurassic Park fanbase. This 1995 release became Crichton's first and only sequel, so if you want to argue that The Lost World feels tacked on, well fair enough, it was. But is it deserving of that famous Malcolm quote? I'd argue definitely not. This isn't some cheap cash grab that was slapped together, but missed the majesty, the wonder, or the ideas presented in Jurassic Park. In every way, Steven Spielberg and returning screenwriter David Kep continued to advance the themes throughout. We still get a movie about control, nature, parenthood, corporate greed, and arrogance. Now, I wouldn't argue that the second film is anywhere as amazing as the first, but it still holds up in many regards. Before I get ahead of myself, Let's continue. The characters are idiots, the story's absurd, the effects aren't as good as the first movie, so what's the point in seeing it? For me, I'm a glutton for f***ing punishment. So, let us sink our teeth into the Lost World. The first point on the characters will be covered later, but how is the story absurd? What's so crazy about InGen wanting to try this idea again after corporate sabotage? Creating dinosaurs is a huge investment to just walk away from. Everything about Peter Ludlow's plan makes sense, and I would totally be on board, of course only if the animals are treated well. Well, never mind. And after the events on Isla Nublar, obviously John Hammond and Ian Malcolm would be opposed to do this, so the story basically writes itself. Also, I have to ask, how are the effects worse? Did we watch the same movie? The Lost World, to this day, 25 years later, holds up tremendously well in regards to the special effects. It's still the best looking Jurassic movie. Like the first film, there's a great blend between what's done practically and with computers. Stan Winston returned to create the animatronics, but of course for some of the larger, more dynamic shots, Industrial Light and Magic came back for the CGI. Both have improved since 1993. The cute little Comsognathus puppets look and move beautifully. That juvenile Stegosaurus Sarah encounters, gosh, I never once doubted that a Stego was really there. It still looks perfect. Better than anything we see today. Far better than the animatronics in Dominion. Not even Purple Guy could have made them this lifelike. It's only overshadowed by what might possibly be the most realistic practical effect ever put to screen, the baby T-Rex. Oh my god! 
that thing, that thing is real. The way it looks, the way it moves, the way it sounds, there's no way it's fake. Okay, I have just been informed that it's fake, but still, holy dung. If it weren't for the scientific inaccuracies, I'd have no problem believing that Spielberg hired real non-avian dinosaur actors for this. So when Doug makes these claims, I question whether we watched the same movie. So we start off on a different island where a family on their yacht is spending their vacation. Rich people in a monster movie? Well, I'm sure this is gonna end fine for them. Okay, dude, are you not paying attention? It does end well for them. John Hammond clearly states that Kathy's okay. Uh, what little girl is this? Any real child would take a look at that little green monster and go, I don't know about Doug or you guys at home, but I freaking loved animals as a kid. I still do today. I spent most of my childhood watching reruns of Zabumafu. I measured time in Zabumafu episodes. If I saw a copy like Kathy here, I would have had the same reaction. Talk to it and share my sandwich. I'm sure I'm not alone here. Yeah, I get that comedy is a big part of the Nostalgia Critic brand, but is it really that hard to imagine kids liking small creatures? In these types of channels, they have to be more careful. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's comedy, what's criticism, or what's both. And now for comedically over the top scream in 3, 2, 1! And then we cut to this. Was the movie trying to make us think she was screaming at Jeff Goldblum? Wait, so when meeting a cute animal, he wants an over-the-top reaction from the daughter, but when a mom sees her daughter being swarmed, she needs to tone it down? That doesn't sound right. And how does Doug not understand a transition? It's self-explanatory. The mom's not yelling at Malcolm. Instead, we cut from her posing with her mouth wide open on a tropical beach to Ian in a seemingly similar setting and similar position. As he walks, it's revealed to us that, no, he's really in the subway. I'm sure I'll say this a lot, but it's one of the best in film. Period. So we see our main character, Ian Malcolm. <laughs> Let's just call him Jeff Goldblum, because we all know that's who he's really playing. Apparently, I can't go a minute without chiming in, but this comes across as one of Goldblum's more subdued roles. Yeah, some movies require him to be his fun, bubbly self, but really? The Lost World? Goldblum's even more serious than he was in the first movie. For that first hour before the crap hit the fan, despite being the moral compass, Ian still acted silly, even childish. What we get in the sequel is a continuation of Ian's character in the second half of the original. Yeah, he makes sarcastic comments, but takes the dire situation seriously from the start. On top of it, he's with his girlfriend and daughter now, not a bunch of randos. The stakes are much higher, and we can see that. Okay, okay, let's continue. You lied. You twisted the facts surrounding the deaths of three people. Three? A f***ing scientist who can't count. Why did nobody believe him when he said there were dinosaurs again? That's, that's chaos, dude. Well, Critic, you are correct about there being five deaths, or cinco muertes. However, you need to remember that Malcolm can only speak to his knowledge. He's not omniscient. None of the visitors in Jurassic Park were ever informed of the worker turned velociraptor snack in the opening. They also never found out what happened to Nedry. We the audience know because we watched a movie. For all the protagonists know, he made it out alive. That makes three Malcolm would know about. Remember, Ian doesn't own a copy of Jurassic Park on VHS. Okay, so there's another island with dinosaurs, no fences this time, and you want to send people in, very few people, on the ground. Well, right now, Jeff Goldblum impressionist, rock. Ah, uh, ah, uh, hello, ah, uh, welcome to the Jeff Goldblum Hour. Ah, uh, doing the, ah, uh, perfect, ah, uh, Jeff Goldblum is to uh, insert ahs, ands, and ah, uh, bots in, in every, every sentence. Man, I really do enjoy seeing these brothers on screen together. When they're not playing characters, they have such great chemistry. Rob tends to make a lot of good points when they do reviews. He might even be better at his job than Doug. Generally, the more Rob in a video, the better. You didn't contact Sarah. Paleontological behavior study is a brand new field and Sarah Harding is on that frontier. How the hell do you go on a trip to an abandoned island filled with dinosaurs and not tell your boyfriend? I guess like most women, she just wanted to get as far away from Jeff Goldblum as possible. 
Sarah immediately explains why. Ian almost became Dino Lunch, so she knew he'd freak out. Here we start getting into some of the themes that Doug refuses to acknowledge. One big cornerstone of Jurassic Park was exploring man's hubris, man's ego, taking scientific leaps without exploring the ramifications, and thinking about how we can control these forces of nature to make profit. This continues with InGen for sure, but also for most of our leads. Sarah is a zoologist who's using InGen's creation to make cutting-edge discoveries to find evidence that supports her ideas of parental care in non-avian dinosaurs, opposed to Dr. Burke, who we see later. Because she worked with predatory animals before, Sarah foolishly considers herself up for the challenge. The crew's documentarian, Nick Van Owen, is another victim of his own ego. He jokes about winning a Pulitzer Prize for his stegosaurus shots, and puts himself on a pedestal with a false sense of superiority because of his environmentalist views. Later on, it's extremist actions sparked by these views that cause several deaths. Even the lovable Eddie Carr puts too much trust in his equipment to keep everyone safe, equipment that utterly fails when it's needed the most. The technology works just fine, but human error. Everyone is blinded by pride aside from Ian and Kelly. Oh, did I put on the soundtrack to the first Jurassic Park again? Oh, come on. The Lost World has its own incredible soundtrack composed by the amazing John Williams again. For some reason, you've chosen to ignore it. Okay, the original theme plays like two or three times, but there's still lots of new music that perfectly captures the jungle safari tone. That's one of the many things I love about this one. Tonally, it feels entirely different than the first, something that can't be said about most cash grab sequels. It's like another Temple of Doom, since both are much darker and more brutal than their predecessors, with new music to capture that. Also, both are completely underrated. I've seen Temple of Doom enough times to be sick of it, but as a movie, I think it's also really good. The Lost World though, I can watch endlessly. Both are flawed, but still deserve far more praise than they got. Poor Spielberg, the man makes two unique and exciting sequels, but people don't appreciate them until decades after. I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are gonna love it. At least he got a wife from it. We also come across Kelly, Goldblum's only daughter. Wait a minute, one daughter? Me? Oh, oh, hell yeah, three. I love kids. What's with this idiot in numbers? Nobody ever says that Kelly's his only daughter. From his conversation with Alan, we can infer that Ian's had several wives, so his three children are probably scattered throughout. This isn't explicitly stated, but it doesn't have to be. You married? Occasionally. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for a future ex Mrs. Malcolm. Us audiences can make these logical, simple inferences. Hey, I'm not the one who uh, <laughs> dumped you here and split for Paris, so don't take it out on me. Nice parroting there, Goldblum. Why don't you bring up her aborted brother while you're at it? Oh wow, that issue won't totally blow up in the slightest. I could comment on that, but unlike a lot of members of the paleo community, I've learned that you're not here for me to shove my political views down your throats. You're here for the dinosaurs, not Dobbs v. Jackson commentary. Anyway, I hate being that guy, the one who pretends he's a know-it-all, but Nostalgia Critic, once again, misses the point. Not get the point. Ian's supposed to be a bad parent. That's the point of the scene. He's neglectful towards Kelly, so she wants him to pay attention to her. Any sort of attention, even if it is punishments. She's asking him to act like an actual parent. Wow, we haven't even gotten to Isla Sorna yet, and I'm already three pages in with this script. Come on, critic. How has the film barely started, yet I have so much material? They then come across a couple of stegosauruses and marvel in wonder. And yeah, don't get used to this whole enchanting thing, by the way. There's very little of it in this movie. But the parents see her and charge in an angry rage. This, of course, results in a thrilling anticlimax. Man, I love how we skipped over so many of the wonderful moments in this scene and the thrilling moments later, then proceeds to criticize the lack of wonder and thrill. We just got that amazing stegosaurus animatronic, yet it was entirely brushed over. Also, unlike the original where the first half consisted of our leads exploring the island and learning how it works, the Lost World isn't a retread. It's its own movie, it has a darker tone and its own story to tell. So, sorry the characters don't spend as much time fawning over dinosaurs. They're too busy, 
uh, I don't know, saving them? You know, in the first Jurassic Park, they at least tried to set up some character and interesting conversation. Let's play a game. A little game I like to call... Try to be invested. Seriously, just try to be interested. So listen, when you're out in the field, nothing we can do can leave any room people to say that our findings uh, are contaminated. I'd be happy to a letter to your wife the or your loved one, give them a chance to say goodbye to okay? We leave no or sense Eddie, of any you got kind, any personal no effects of any kind. Of any kind. No Critic, my guy, I love playing games with my viewers too, but stop me if I sound like a broken record. You're missing the point of the scene. The audience isn't supposed to invest in the two conversations going on at once. The scene is meant to build the character dynamic between Sarah and Ian. Sarah is laying some ground rules for Nick and Eddie to better conduct their research on Sorna. Malcolm, knowing better, is trying to pry them away from this crazy expedition. He's doing everything in his power to stop them, in this case, interrupting Sarah's instructions. This conflict has been happening already and will continue until everyone agrees to escape with their lives. But it's about the push and pull from both of these characters. Can I just see the lawyer getting eaten again? God, that's awesome. Can I just watch that for two hours? And just like that, Nostalgia Critic predicted the Jurassic World movies. I'm sure he's joking here, but this is the kind of advice that sank the series. Rather than making more well-written stories with engaging characters and sparing but very thrilling action, future movies 2001 and beyond mostly just took more and more dinosaurs, threw them at the screen, accompanied by loud noises, and called it a day. Of course, there are some exceptions, two or three legitimately good scenes in each future film, but mostly just brain-dead dinosaur action, and locusts, lots and lots of locusts. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Yes, the first movie and The Lost World have some action scenes too, and some moments of pure spectacle, but they mostly succeed in filmmaking, writing good movies too while they're at it. The dinosaurs are still used more sparingly and used to further the characters and the story, not just dinosaur action for the sake of dinosaur action. The dinosaurs should be a means to an end, a means to progressing the characters and story, rather than the end in and of themselves. When it comes to dinosaurs, less is more. Everyone thinks they want a movie about dinosaurs eating people, but what audiences really want is an intelligent movie about people trying to survive dinosaurs. That subtlety is the difference between Jurassic Park and Jurassic World Dominion. The first is an exciting thriller that explores several interesting ideas through likable characters. The latter is run from this dinosaur then run from this dinosaur, then run from this dinosaur. Alright, moving on to the next point. Oh, it's that Peter jerk again. And this time he's accompanied by another Peter, Pete Pufflethwaite, and his killer cheekbones, as they try to hunt down some dinosaurs for their zoo in America. The one, the one with the big red horn, the pompadour. Really? You hire people to hunt dinosaurs who don't even know the names of the dinosaurs? Do you even know their names? Besides, Roland is a hunting expert. He doesn't need to be a paleontologist. That's what the paleontologist is for. So our heroes look over the horror of what they're seeing and they let it all sink in. After all, we're going after innocent creatures like this. Or this. Or even adorable this. If this was solely meant to be a joke, I might have found it funny, but this sounds like just another baseless criticism. None of the theropods he showed were targeted by InGen. They're clearly only going after the herbivores and unassuming carnivores. Very, very clearly, they're not planning to encounter velociraptors. That's not the problem. What is? Velociraptors. Our infrared show that their nesting sites are concentrated in the island interior, which is why we... Plan to keep to the wait, room. Wait, wait a minute. Tyrannosaurus does appear on Roland's animal list, but that list seems to just be about the fauna on the island, not specifically their targets. His plan was only to kill a Rex, not capture it. That move was improvised after he was only able to tranquilize one. So the two Peters come across a baby Tyrannosaurus and trap it in order to capture the mother. <laughs> Seriously, did we watch entirely different films? Roland clearly expresses that his aim is to hunt a male Tyrannosaurus. Hey! Where do you think you're going? To collect my fee, Mr. Ludlow, to collect my fee. 
I have no idea where Doug gets these ideas, and I need to mention how amazing Pete Possaway is here as Roland. Critic complimented his cheekbones, yet nothing else about him or the character, which is a crime against humanity. Roland Tembo is easily my favorite and one of the best in the whole series. I mean, there's not much competition afterwards, but still worth saying. Like everyone else, Roland thinks of himself as above nature, feeling the need to prove himself to prove man as the ultimate predator rather than the T-Rex. Wow, don't let Horner hear that kind of talk. Roland truly lives for the thrill, always looking for another adventure. When they asked him, they said, why did you go up there to die? He said, I didn't. I went up there to live. He's gotten bored by everything else. Hunting Tyrannosaurus is all that's left. After his success, he realizes how it was all for naught when his right-hand man, AJ gets killed. Like Hammond, he's able to acknowledge the failure of his pursuits, how everything he's worked towards is ultimately pointless. He's wasted his life thrill-seeking and lost his friend doing so. Roland's such a great antagonist too. I love how he's not this evil, one-note hunter guy like Ken Wheatley from Fallen Kingdom. No, his character is actually well-layered. Even though he's been hired by Ludlow, Roland is still a person. He shows genuine concern for the well-being of our leads, even if they are on opposing sides. When he notices blood on Savage's jacket, he immediately calls for everyone to break from their hike just so he can check up on her. When Deodor goes missing after his very brutal death scene, he insists that nobody mentions it to Kelly so she doesn't get scared. This is what the future installments needed. Less cartoony, mustache-twirling villains and more humanity. So, like friggin' idiots, they let all the dinosaurs out of their cages. And <laughs> wouldn't you know it, they run amok. What? What? How is that idiotic? That's literally the reason they went to Sorna, to stop InGen from making a Jurassic Park on the mainland. What does Critic want them to do? Let Ludlow take dinosaurs to San Diego? Write a strongly worded letter? These dinosaurs have been plucked from their homes and abused. Freeing them is the least our leads can do. Plus, they're being freed on an island where dinosaurs already roam free. Yes, it would be unfortunate for any of the crew members to sustain injuries from this. I value human life above animal life, and certainly above the lives of artificially created extinct animals. Don't tell Nick that. But these guys have to suffer the consequences of their own actions. They came to poach innocent dinosaurs out of a dinosaur island. If a few get loose and rampage around, that's their problem. And if you think that was stupid of our heroes, take a gander at this. They find the baby T-Rex and bring him to the trailer! Why don't you just write eat me all over you? Okay, yeah, it's a bad idea to take in a baby T-Rex, but these aren't noble heroes. They're clearly flawed individuals who make some poor decisions thanks to their arrogance. This isn't to excuse dumb and nonsensical characters in media, what I'm saying is how this is already in line with something these characters would do. Nick is a fanatical animal rights activist, while Sarah has a false sense of invincibility from her previous studies. Taking a Tyrannosaurus juvenile from his nest to set his legs is a very believable action for these characters. Of course, this leaves Ian mortified as he's seen this all before. He understands not only what the dinosaurs are capable of, but what nature is capable of. It spits in the face of humans who think they can control it, best it, or profit from it. Dang, you really feel for this guy. He's the only person on the entire island who knows what's up, yet nobody cares to listen to him. It reminds me of 2013, when I was the only one who called out Bioshock Infinite for being terrible in every conceivable way. The internet eventually caught up to me, but still relatable. So they let the baby T-Rex out and everything seems to be okay. But wouldn't you know it, T-Rexes are vengeful now, as they come back and try to shove the trailer off the cliff. This is clearly explained in the movie. And the Rexes may continue to track us too if they perceive a threat to themselves or to their infant. The Rexes feel the need to patrol and defend their territory after the assault on their child. And even if Sarah didn't blatantly explain this, of course they're going to attack the people who took their baby. That's a no-brainer. This isn't vengeance, it's animal parenting. Well, some animals can remember people and be spiteful, but that's obviously not what's happening here. Wait a 
minute. A second ago, they couldn't get the glass open. Now the slightest bit of pressure is gonna bust it? I don't know how this comment made it past the editing room. First, Nick and Ian are pushing on what is clearly a different material. Second, the rest of the windows in the trailer are reinforced by metal bars. Even if the protagonists broke them, they still wouldn't have been able to squeeze through. And third, Sarah fell how many feet and slammed into the back window? I'm no physicist, but that clearly exerted more force than Nick's shoving. Also, shame on Nostalgia Critic for not acknowledging how fantastic this scene is. There's not a dinosaur in sight for this bit, and it's still super suspenseful. One of Spielberg's best for sure, which is really saying something. I miss those slower, more methodical action sequences that allowed attention to build. We don't get enough of this anymore. Now tell me, why the hell did these two come back? Maybe instead of just leaving them on a cliff, they were like, Oh yeah, we're dinosaurs, let's eat something! Well, like I said before, the Tyrannosaurs now feel the need to protect and patrol their territory, eliminating potential threats. This big, loud machine may have caught their attention. Oh, and also food. They need lots and lots of food. We're talking about two 8-ton behemoths. A better question is, why would they pass up on a free snack? Surprisingly enough, Doug doesn't complain much about Eddie's death, despite it being a big point of contention. I'll address it anyway, just to cover all the bases. He certainly gets one of the most gruesome deaths, but it's played off as a heroic sacrifice. I mean, this guy fights like heck to save his friends, to the point where he's still pulling them up while getting surrounded by Rexes. The brutality only serves to elevate his sacrifice. It's tragic. Eddie's death was so undeserved since the dinosaurs don't discriminate. They don't know who the protagonists and antagonists are. This misfortune is highlighted by Ian shortly after. Plus, the scene isn't so dragged out like it indulges in the violence. The Lost World is goofy at points and pays homage to the creature features that came before, but it largely takes itself seriously. Similarly, when Deirdre gets killed by Kamsangnathis, it's to show the comeuppance of the animals attacking the people who came to poach their land. Deirdre mistreated them, mistreated the Kamsangnathis, and now they're striking back. It also serves to show just how deadly the island was. Anyone who strayed too far could become a dinosaur snack. So rather than feeling like a walk in the woods, it added tension and suspense to the film. This isn't Jurassic World, where Zara, a minor character who does literally nothing, gets a completely unnecessary, overly long death just because it looks cool. And then no one ever addresses it. So they journey to the only control tower where they can possibly make contact. One of the hunters, played by Peter Stormare, gets attacked by the Kamuppensaurus because he attacked them earlier. The other hunters forget about him almost as fast as the audience does. Critic, please, please just watch the movie. Roland and Ajay notice Theodore missing shortly after. They question the other hunters, then go off to look for him. Before the T-Rex couple attacks again, the two return with news of his devourment. So either you talked with Rob over half of the movie, or you already knew this but elected to ignore it. Telling a joke is not worth misinforming your audience. If you're gonna be inaccurate with your film criticism, then make it abundantly clear that you're joking. Turns out it's the T-Rex because he smells the blood on Julianne Moore's jacket. They said before his eyesight's based on movement, but now he operates by smell. You would think he would smell Dr. Grant and the girl in the first movie, seeing how his nose was right in front of them. But hey, their ancestor's a mosquito, I'm sure their genes got f***ed somewhere. Let's put science aside, since we know Tyrannosaurus had some of the best vision and smell to ever grace our planet. This is a Hollywood blockbuster, not a documentary. Don't take anything here as fact. The Rex in the first Jurassic Park was not out to murder everybody. She could have easily done that if she wanted to, but no. This was a curious animal who's been let loose in the modern world. Throughout this terrifying experience, we see her investigating, studying her new environment. Heck, you would be valid in saying that the T-Rex was toying with everybody. One of the many aspects that makes this such a suspenseful scene is the creature's unpredictability. We have no idea how our Rex is going to respond to our protagonist and the new environment. Two species separated by 65 million years of evolution have just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together. How can we possibly have the slightest idea what to expect? 
Here in the Lost World, the Buck and Doe are actively pursuing the humans, not playing. So yeah, that nose is gonna come in handy. So of course everyone starts fleeing in fear and the T-Rex tries to catch up with them. Kinda weird! In the first movie, the T-Rex was fast enough to catch up with the Jeep. In this movie, he's struggling to keep up with a large crowd of people. Okay, this is inconsistent with the original, can't fault you here. Congratulations, it only took 17 and a half minutes for a valid criticism. Meanwhile, the raptors attack and Goldblum's gang tries to get away from them. No, oh, don't you remember they can open doors? And that too. Critic, this isn't a simple pull-down handle like the doors in the first movie. It's a knob that you need to turn, which is far beyond the dexterous capabilities of even fictional velociraptors. But now we have to talk about one of the most infamous parts of the movie. I love the fact that the raptor actually turns when she says, Hey, you. I thought these things were supposed to be super intelligent, and the move that gets the drop on them is, Hey, you? Have you considered that it's not the words, Hey, you, that caused the raptor to turn? You know how, when you make a loud noise, animals look. That's more than likely what's going on here. Kelly could have shouted anything to achieve the same result, but being a speaker of the English language, and because this is a commonly said phrase in English, Kelly chose to say, Hey, you. Despite the clear misinterpretation of events, yeah, this isn't a good moment. Am I going to let a bad 20 seconds ruin an otherwise great two hour movie? No. Now would also be a good time to discuss the child parent relationships we see throughout the Lost World. Ian has a similar character arc to Alan in the first movie. At the start of our journey, he's not very involved as a parent. Although Ian's been left with custody over Kelly, he barely ever spends time with her. Like with Sarah, he's never around unless there's some emergency. This is obviously negative, but there is the positive that by being left unattended, Kelly's more capable, more self-reliant, and able to take care of herself. Her strength, her maturity is shown on full display here. She's able to bring down a velociraptor so it wasn't all bad. Once we get to the ending, we see the three finally spending time together as a family. Ian's realized the error of his ways and seen how his actions have pushed Sarah and Kelly away into bad situations. The Tyrannosaurus family goes through a similar arc. When we meet the young Rex, he's left alone while his parents hunt or patrol or something, leaving him vulnerable to attack. Like Ian, the parents do show up and do care when there's an emergency. But once the San Diego sequence gets resolved, the buck does parent his son, teaching him to hunt. After their return to Sorna in the closing scene, they stick together as a healthy family. On the other side of things, Hammond's nephew Peter Ludlow has always been fed with a silver spoon. So rather than growing, making the most of a bad situation, he becomes an incompetent leader who can't possibly live up to his uncle who actually earned his wealth. We can't tell exactly how he was raised, but Ludlow certainly went down the opposite path from Kelly, becoming less capable. I will save the last example of parenting for later, but for now, let's move on with this review. But Pothelthwaite still wants to take care of that darn T-Rex. But you, but you stole their bullets?! The T-Rex is eating people, you- you're honestly going to take away their only means of defending themselves? Jesus! Again, this is in character, but notice what Nick actually did. We see other Injun hunters firing their guns, so Nick didn't sabotage all of them or try to stop them from defending themselves. The weird Jurassic Park dinosaur plot armor does that. This means Nick only stole shotgun shells from Roland. Why? Because he wanted to hunt the male T-Rex as a trophy. Nick didn't know the pair would attack in the middle of the night with Roland's shotgun as the crew's last means of defense. Yes, it wasn't a smart move to make, but a far cry from nostalgia critic rant worthy. You're terrible heroes, all of you! You deserve to be shot! Damn it, Vaughn! Okay, this gag made me laugh. Nice work. I guess in the long run it doesn't matter because they still capture the T-Rex anyway and bring him to San Diego. As it seems the T-Rex got out of his cage, ate the crew, and somehow locked himself back in the cage. Look at this, don't you love it how the T-Rex ripped a guy from his hand and yet somehow didn't damage any other part of the room? Consider it animal, isn't he? But that brings us to another controversial topic. As much as I enjoy the San Diego sequence, 
Yeah, the setup getting there doesn't make much sense. Clayton Fioriti has awesome videos on fan theories and the writer's original intentions, but still none of it translates well to film. We're supposed to believe that the Rex escaped from its cage, broke out, ate the crew, then somehow ended up trapped inside the ship? If a worker was alive to trap him, then how come no one was alive to steer the ship or contact the Coast Guard? And how come we don't see that much damage to the venture itself? This is another point for Nostalgia Critic. The events leading up to the San Diego incident should have been more clear. Now you're John Hammond. That's right. Now you're John Hammond. I didn't even know we were supposed to hate him by this point, but do I hate him now? Uh, yeah. John Hammond is a very sweet old man who is more misguided in his actions rather than malicious. With such an amazing performance from the late Richard Attenborough, it's impossible to hate him. That flea circus scene may be one of the best in the original out of many fantastic scenes, but you have to remember, despite his kind grandpa exterior, his poor judgment caused the deaths of several people. Ludlow is refusing to learn from his uncle's failure, or at least he's learned the wrong lessons. Rather than thinking, hmm, maybe trying to play God, controlling forces we don't understand, isn't such a good thing, all he learned was, let's go smaller and build closer to home. So yes, after the San Diego Park idea blows up in his face, it is appropriate to make comparisons. Oh look, even Boomer makes a cameo in this movie. What about Boomer? Um, we'll get you another Boomer. Can movies please stop killing off dogs? That buck can eat as many people as his four-chambered heart desires, but doggies are off limits. They're too precious for this. And we see the T-Rex ripping the city a new one. This is a hard trick to pull off. Having the T-Rex wreak havoc on San Diego while making it still feel like an actual animal itself. Spielberg succeeded in this balancing act since it's not there to just murder and destroy everything. I guess you could technically call him a movie monster without him feeling like an actual monster. In line with the breakout scene, there are many moments when the buck acts animalistic, silly even. Sometimes it almost feels like it's playing. This sequence is loads of fun, but serves to completely hammer the film's message. Leave nature alone, it isn't your plaything to make money out of. This is the ultimate nail in the coffin because Ludlow doesn't fail in isolation like Hammond. He can't cover this up. Now the entire world has seen his mistakes and can learn from them. If Jurassic Park failed twice due to sabotage, what's to stop someone else from trying again, hopefully without the sabotage this time? After this mayhem, who on earth would support another park? Oh. And thus we get our last minute moral from the evil John Hammond. Oh, I hate him so much, I hate him so much. Oh wait, the music's indicating we like him now. Well, he is in the middle of a beautifully written monologue, showing that now he's finally learned his lesson. In the previous entry and the start of this one, he viewed himself as a godlike figure, creating life before and an entirely sustainable ecosystem here. It's yet another parent-child relationship. During Jurassic Park, John kept them fed, he kept them safe, he was there for all of their births and provided lysine. Between films, the dinosaurs on Sorna ran wild after Hurricane Clarissa struck. It's as if they matured. The dinosaurs stopped needing him, yet he still tried to step in for their protection. Now, as we've reached the film's conclusion, Hammond's learned to let go of that parental or godlike role. Now that dinosaurs exist, now that they're living on their own, it's best for humans to just leave them alone. That's why the somber music plays. God, what a terrible follow up to a <laughs> movie. I'm not gonna act like the first film was perfect, but it was a basic fun survival flick. Well, that's the understatement of the year. There's no sense of wonder, no sense of adventure. It's just set up scenes for the dinosaurs to walk in and destroy. That's it! The only good thing to come out of this is maybe someone will possibly get the idea to film King Lear with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, did you forget about Roland Tembo? Some great performances, enjoyable yet flawed protagonist, masterfully done suspense scenes while executed continuations of the original's ideas, incredible special effects, and the awesome soundtrack. The Lost World is by no means a perfect movie, but there is so much to enjoy. 
So that concludes my response to Nostalgia Critic and Lost World Hatred in general. Most of it is totally baseless. I know the point of these long movie rant videos, which is basically an entire genre on YouTube, is to make fun of bad movies, but the humor gets in the way of the criticism, as Doug makes jokes that are super misleading. I don't know how he missed so much that's blatantly apparent. I don't want to come across as a know-it-all, but come on, he missed so much. Also, because he's only making fun of what are perceived flaws, it causes him to ignore the blockbuster's many positive qualities. If the only good thing you can say about Roland is that he has nice cheekbones, then you're clearly not being fair. Overall, Steven Spielberg didn't hit the same highs as the original, but created a worthy sequel. It's not only the best JP sequel by a mile, but a very good movie in its own right. I'm even tempted to say great. The Lost World is definitely unworthy of all the hate flung its way over the past 25 years. Before I end the video, I should remind all my viewers that this isn't about hating on the nostalgia critic or showing how much smarter I am. I don't want to see any insults going his way. I'm only here to defend a good film with a bad reputation. With that out of the way, remember if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.